Hey guys, Trent, Damian, we're here for the fourth and final video in our H2B series. Today we're going to discuss the I-129 application, which is the last and final step of H2B. So if that interests you, stick around. So what's the I-129? This is your application that you file with USCIS. And it's actually not just used for the H-2B visa, it's used for a large range of visas. You might be familiar with it for other reasons if you've been through the immigration process before. But today we're just talking about the I-129 in the context of the H-2B. But it's worth noting, the I-129 is 35, 40 pages, but like Damien mentioned, it applies to several other visas, so you're only gonna need to fill out part of that application. And it's very important that you fill out the correct parts because if you don't, uh, you're going to be turning that in with basically your entire packet from the Department of Labor certification, which if you watched the last video, can be up to 500 pages long. And you got to send in two copies. So you'll file your I-129, like a thousand pages of papers, literally. It might get rejected. And unlike the Department of Labor, USCIS does not like to work over email. So you're sending your thousand pages, they'll send it back. So now you're out $150 before you've even begun the process and you have to correct whatever was incorrect, send it back again. So as we mentioned, the I-129, it's 35, 40 pages, doesn't all apply to you. What does apply to you, most of it, you've already put into your 9141, your 9142B, it's pretty simple information about you, your business, addresses, etc. And again, the prevailing wage, which you did way back at the start of this process, probably many months ago at this point, is going to be, have to be included as well. And you're going to have to print out that entire temporary statement of need and attachments and send that in as well, which is why you get such a big document. All right. Envision everything that you've submitted to the Department of Labor prevailing wage, statement of need, recruiter agreements, everything. If you submitted it in the previous step, you're submitting it again. And in addition, because now you're working with USCIS, not the Department of Labor, don't forget that if you are working with a representative, you're also going to have to send in a G28, which is basically a document that says a representative can act on your behalf. And there's some other quirks to the USCIS process, which we don't want to get into here. Well, there is the beneficiary sections of the I-129. This is where if you know your beneficiary, you need all of their information. You and need... who's the beneficiary? The Just beneficiary so they know. Yeah. is the employee that you would like to bring to work for your company. What if you don't know the employees though? If right? you don't know them, you have to list them as unnamed beneficiaries. And don't forget to put what country they're coming from. Right. That's a kind of a big pitfall. People you forget can put that. The, yeah. You can put the consulate that you would like this sent to after approval. And even though the consulate might be in Mexico, you got to specify that you're getting Mexican workers because sometimes the French like to come into the United States to the Monterey Embassy. Not, it's not a true story. But it's a true story that we've had something sent back, a request for evidence because we didn't put Mexico when in fact we'd already put the Monterey Embassy. So live, you know, live and learn. Within and the learning. application, in our defense, the application is not very clear. At all. It says name your beneficiaries. We write unnamed. We know that's what we're supposed to do. Then it says country of this beneficiary. And even though we don't know who the beneficiary is, you're kind of, you're making up a country that you know they're coming from. So you just got to make sure that that, you know, coordinates with what your recruiter is doing, yada, yada, yada. These are all details, but the point is that the details do matter. And how do you know which consulate to choose? Well, that you got to do a little bit of digging. It There's just... seven. One feature of the HCB visa program that we may not have mentioned is your beneficiaries are allowed to bring dependents. This is something if you know who your beneficiary is, specify how many dependents they're going to bring. Your, your beneficiary can bring dependents. You just need to know ahead of time. So, as we mentioned, everything you've submitted, step two, and that 9142 to the Department of Labor, step one, your prevailing wage, everything you've submitted has to be resubmitted. And that list will include, just to recap, this needs your final decision from the Department of Labor. Your signed 9142 Appendix B. The original. The original. Your recruiter information and your recruiter agreement. Your prevailing wage determination, that's your 9141. Your recruitment report, your G28, and your statement of temporary need. Oh yeah, don't forget the check. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah, what's it come to about? 1835. 
$1,835.00. There's no way around this. There is no fee waiver for the H2B. And this doesn't uh, include your shipping costs of the actual application. You're going to add another $100, $150 for overnight service. You want the overnight service. And the reason you want to do that is expedited service means you get resolved in 15 days, non-expedited. It can take two months. It can take three months. All that time is eating into your H2B workers' uh, time allowed to stay in the country. So instead of getting somebody from nine months, you get them for six months. And all of a sudden, all that money you think you've saved, you've lost because you've lost a business that you could have gotten with those extra workers. Exactly. Thank you. You do all this, we'd like to tell you that you will get a fair hearing. So doing all this means you put together an application, you attach a check, you send it in. You've already, you already have certification through the Department of Labor. You already have it, you've gone through the hard part. But the truth is that there are many possible frustrating pitfalls, including your entire application being sent back for minor oversights. And they're not gonna overnight it. You spend $150 to overnight your packet to them, they're gonna send it back. It's gonna take a few days. You're gonna be sitting there just kind of waiting, thinking, am I gonna get this back? Is it moving forward? You don't really know. So until, because until your application is accepted for processing, which is what this back and forth, like physical back and forth, physical mail back and forth is about, you don't get any online digital kind of uh, confirmations, confirmations or once your application is accepted, it becomes a little easier because then you can send things back digitally, right? So you once get, it's accepted for processing, once it's accepted for right. processing, and here you get requests for evidence, which are the same thing as a notice of deficiency, except the Department of Labor has stopped calling requests for evidence requests for evidence, and they call them notices of deficiency, and it's just asking you to fix things. The good news is once you've been accepted for processing. You don't have to worry about sending the hard copy, receiving the hard copy, any small details after the acceptance for processing can be fixed during through email. Actually through fax. Through they fax. don't do email. They will they may email you, but then you fax them back. Yeah, so Department of Labor email, right? And fax, USCIS just fax. If you watched the first video in the series, Trent asked let me try that again. If you've watched all of the videos in the series, Trent asked at the beginning of the first video, could a savvy business owner just do this themselves? The short answer is no, you shouldn't because it takes so much time. It actually monopolizes your time because you have to go back and forth with so many agencies. The long answer is like, maybe yeah, you could do it, but unless you're really hard up for cash, at which point you shouldn't probably be engaging in this process, you should hire somebody. If you've watched this video, or especially our series, you can probably tell the process frustrates us, and this is what we do. But it frustrates us like we love it, we like doing it, we take pride in our work, but we anticipate that dumb things are going to happen. You're, we're gonna get some headaches along the way. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to take some aspirin. It's worth it in the long run, but it's a process. If you think we can be a further help, please do contact us. If you'd like to find out more videos, we will be posting more videos in H2B. They won't be as comprehensive, but we'll be going into little niche aspects of this. We'll also be talking about immigration, legal tech, the future of law. And when is, when is the next application process for H2Bs? It starts in a couple of days. We're filming this on September 30th. It starts on October 1st. Uh, we, you know, you'd want to get applications uh, in we'd, and going by January. We'd start with that. That's step one, prevailing wage. And this process, so the second year process, second half of the year process is extremely competitive and timing is of the essence because numbers do start running out, unlike in the first part of the year, which... So if you've watched our series, you're considering the H2B process, have any questions, feel free to comment, contact us, Bull City Lawyer. Yep, we have a comprehensive website. You can get us there. You can also call us at the number at the bottom of the screen. Great. All right. Um, let's do one thing. Let's take a photo. Uh, we need thumbnail photos for our... Thanks.